Well, we're live then, again. Thanks right. for coming, man. This is Kieran, everybody. Thank you for this me. is Kieran, and let me play the Kieran song. I'm Kieran. And this is a song about me, yeah. I used to work with Boggy, but not anymore. Right? Yeah, That's true. exactly. Right. Okay. That's the story of my life. Uh, <laughs> this is Kieran, and he used to work with me. And this is Steftro on the other side, and he never worked with me. He worked against me, as a matter of fact. Mm-hmm. Oh, when did he work with you? When did you work with me, Kieran? Um, I say a good part of the start of this year to roughly summer. Yeah. It was a it was a rough summer if, as far as I remember. It was mm. one of the roughest summers. So rough. No, it wasn't rough. No, I don't know what I'm talking about. But see sometimes I, I go someplace and it doesn't work. So Kieran worked with me uh and uh he's a really cool dude and he decided to come in and he was a uh, he was actually in the audience because you know, as you know, guys, as you know, we all sometimes have a an audience for our podcast and it's not always my fish and Kieran was uh, on the episode with Ricardo he was in the audience and now he's here uh, by himself mm-hmm. you got promoted mm-hmm. you I got did. promoted from a from an audience member to a guest yeah yeah how do you feel Next about time that it will be his show I feel great it feels good so Kieran you, man you're such an interesting guy we we uh, went out a couple of times went to some bars and stuff and we had conversations that were deep they were meaningful mm-hmm. and they were very interesting and this is why I d- uh, decided to invite you because um because you know uh, where Steph Chu fails I hope that you will succeed and this will be a meaningful thing so uh man t- tell us something about about yourself how d- first of all how did you get to Malta Because you're not from here. Originally. No, no, I'm originally from UK. Um, born and bred. Moved to Malta three years ago. Uh, my girlfriend's Maltese. Nice. So I came over here to live Shout out to g- your girlfriend. Is she going to remain anonymous? Um, that's okay. Yeah. I think okay, I'm not going to put you in still, spot. Okay. Still, still good for that. <laughs> that's cool. Well. But yeah, moved to Malta and um, yeah, I kind of got to a point where I wasn't learning anything anymore. So I had to take the opportunity to teach myself things yeah you know um i hit 30 um and i came to a point where i needed to see if i still had it so to speak yeah so i started looking into researching memory and how to improve your memory and things like this and uh one thing that popped up was japanese kanji and mm. learning japanese kanji was that um people say it's the most difficult thing to learn But what is it? Is it a, a Oh, it's the alphabet for Japanese. Oh, the, oh, the alphabet, yeah. okay. So you decided to learn the Japanese alphabet now. Yeah, I just jumped straight into it. But wait a second, you just learned the alphabet or is it it's l- the alphabet but it's like uh there's like words, words right? Yeah, words okay. exactly. So it's like more like learning a, a a dictionary or something. Right, exactly. Wow. How many how many characters is there? Uh 2600. Jesus. Um that's the school pass rate to get you through so you can read a newspaper. Wow. Uh I got up to around 1400. But do you mem- memorize all those 1400? Yeah, every day I'd um I'd write them down. I'd use this system called Anki. Anki's like a SRS system, so it was developed like in the 70s by this uh Polish guy, I think. Mm-hmm. And what it does is it puts things from your short-term memory into your long-term memory um over a course of repetition. Okay, so how does it work? So Let's say you have a a quiz, a maths quiz where you're trying to learn the times tables for example. All right. And you got your three times tables down, so those questions won't ever won't pop back up for four days. Whereas you're struggling with your six times tables, so they will be repeating more. So what you're getting right goes into your uh, has a longer spaced repetition, but the things you're getting wrong are repeated more often. So mm-hmm. you learn the things you keep getting wrong until you start getting them right. And the system then observes this and it says, "Okay, now it's time to move that into long-term memory and it will give you something harder to work on." Right. That's fascinating, man. That's very interesting. Uh, but but how did you decide I'm I'm going to learn the the ganji, was it? Kanji. Kanji. Yeah. How how did you decide? It was it for the benefit of like working your brains or, you know, for for some, you know, health benefits or was it just for fun or it was just to see if I still had it? still had the the knowledge still had the capacity to learn mm. because I came to a point where I felt like uh, I'm 30 and this is a point where you're not educated anymore uh, you know but 
Why, why didn't you choose something that you can use also? Um, I felt it was the hardest thing to do. So I wanted to go for the hardest and that would give me confidence in everything else. This is fucking awesome, man. I mean, this is really interesting. And um, you're, you're from, you know, you're British, right? So yeah, yeah. you've heard probably of Darren Brown. Yes. When I was in, uh, in London for Erasmus, I read his books and he was explaining a lot of those uh, so, so like similar mental tricks for memorizing stuff because a lot of his act back then it was uh, you know those mentalist stuff that like reading your mind but actually putting things in your mind and then picking them up or he had like all kinds of um, tricks that were so difficult because people wouldn't believe that he th those were actually not tricks like mm -hmm. for example he would memorize a, a fat book and then tell you pick pick a random page in a a, a place and he would tell you the the word on this page mm -hmm. and it, and so he was explaining different methods for for memorizing and i remember this one i don't know what it was called but it was like uh we all have memories of some specific uh, routines or places that are so deeply embedded that we always remember like you can be fucking shit faced drunk and and crazy but you still know for example the way to your hometown or to, sure. to your to your house like uh where you grew up and you lived for the first 20 years right so if you were to close your eyes and you you imagine let's say walking from your home to to your school mm. you know everything on the way like mm -hmm. there's a tree on the left and then there's a building and then there's this and then there's a greenhouse and then there's this so every one of those stops you can assign different uh things to them right. like in a book for example so you know this house is the the first 10 pages and then this window of the house is like the first page and this window is the second and then you can you know because you know it so well you can then uh when i tell you page 716 you know that this is in this part of your memory and you conjure something up that you have assigned it to and it's easier to pull it up you know it's, it's like you i don't know you create this pattern and you you, you put it on the pattern instead of just learning and as, as a new thing, you actually learn it on an old thing. You apply it on, a, I don't know. Exactly. But it, it's it's much easier. And, and he would uh, he was able to memorize like huge amounts of information and for, for his act and people would be like, well, how did he do it? He actually learned it. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's how it worked. That's how the kanji worked. You'd uh, have a kanji which would break down into simpler kanji mm -hmm. because um, the more complex kanji are made out of simpler kanji. Right. So for instance, you'd have... Um, like uh, a woman and a house and the house would symbolize the story could be the woman is resting in the house because the kanji makes the word rest let's say for example mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interesting so you're saying that the woman is resting in the house and this is a as you said you assign it to your current memory to memorize something that you don't know yeah did you watch this movie uh, arrival no i haven't seen this movie steph you've seen it right yeah, you remember the the aliens thing with the circle thing they were doing. Yeah, so what the you know the the circles that they were writing the lang the alien yeah. language right. So this was actually a very interesting movie because it it's actually based on a sh uh, a short story. It was written by a math mathematician who then transitioned. Uh, I think it was a Chinese mathematician who started. You writing. know, you know who was he really influenced by? No, for writing this. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut. Really? Why? How come? Yeah, uh, I mean, he also has this book, Slaughterhouse Five. Oh yeah, I, mean, I read that. Yeah, it's kind of the same idea that time is not linear. Yeah, but also it's another That's... idea. Well, yeah, this is true. But I wanted to bring it up back to the kanji uh, topic because um, there was a couple of ideas in this movie, and one of them was an extrapolation of the idea that you uh, get to know a certain civilization by their language mm. because the uh, the language contains like cultural information it's a very interesting idea because what happened was uh, this movie okay without spoiling it too much it's about these aliens that come to earth and they communicate in a way that no one understands them so scientists send over like a linguist and some like army people or whatever to try to communicate with them so the linguist played by amy adams i think yeah uh she starts learning this language and as she learns the language she also uh starts uh, kind of assuming some of the qualities of the aliens they it's specifically they were able to travel in time in a non-linear way like the, for them the time was like a like you could go back and forth in in, in within yeah, your you, like you just life. spoiled it yeah, no, no, <laughs> yeah wait, I mean, I wait, wait a second I no, already spoiled no it's, so, yeah. it's a you know but but wait a second if, if you learn about the time you can then move back and, and unspoil it anyway so my point is 
so this way she kind of started traveling in time as she was learning language, right. uh, which is you know impossible. But but it's based on this real concept, which is like you know I don't know. Uh, let's say you can say that uh, Spanish speaking countries, let's say in, in South America, are more passionate because their language is more staccato or something or more mm. expressive. Mm. But the other languages are more whatever other. So what have you? Uh, picked up something about Japan or Japanese culture from studying their language? Sure, sure. Um, often when I see English subtitles now, I can see that they're direct translations of the exact kanji word. Right. Like the translation may use the word yonda for something that's in the distance mm -hmm. because yonda directly has a kanji. Mm -hmm. So you can see that why this subtitle exists in this form. So Jimi Hendrix, when he was singing about yonda, he was actually... Yeah, uh, he was uh, <laughs> using his Japanese spirits. He was possessed by them, and um, yeah, there was a song about there was something about yonder. I don't know. Anyway, so yeah, so, that's that's interesting. So you know when translators suck. <laughs> yeah. Do you do you pick up like wrong translations in movies that that I mean, piss that, you off I mean, now? Um, From like Japanese stuff that they they didn't do right. Well, well, you notice that it's not I mean, that, in context. That sounds like something correctly. not right. If if you know that, I mean, what was the Japanese word? I don't know. The kanji. Yeah. If I, if I understood correctly. Anyway, whatever. But the, the, the second interesting thing I learned from this was um, I was using a system called Aja, which means all Japanese all the time. And the idea of language acquisition is that you listen to something constantly and there's four stages or three stages. First, it's just gibberish. Then your brain starts to find patterns in the language. And you'll pick up words like chotomate uh, or something like, which means wait up. Or words that you commonly hear, like in English would be hello. I, I hear chotomate all the time, Good man. Good morning. You know, I go to the store and I'll go, chotomate. I go, what the fuck, man? And now I know it's Japanese. <laughs> no, it's like you'd, you'd pick up these little words. Yeah. And same in English. Like you'd, even a foreigner would know things like please, thank you. Yeah. And it's quite common, you know, in other languages such as Spanish. But first it starts off as gibberish. Then you pick up little words. Then you pick up sentences. Then it comes to a point where you, kn you know more than you don't know. And this can be acquired just by listening to the language constantly, constantly, right. constantly. And it's put forward by a guy called Katsumoto, who has uh, a website. I think I've met him. About um, <laughs> all wondering. Japanese all the time. So He looks kind of like his eyes are like this, right? Um, he's actually... This uh, is racist. Uh, this is very deeply disturbing when I just... <laughs> anyway, sorry. But he's, he's a, yeah, it's a very cool idea to, that you can acquire uh, any language just by listening to the patterns that exist in it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the melodic... Uh, the, the way the, the melody works and the intonation in the language is yeah, yeah. Uh, very specific. I remember this Reggie guy you played... He was doing this thing. Have you heard of Reggie Watts? Watts? No, no. So this this guy. He's the thing is, he's he's like speaking the language without knowing it. I mean, just, exactly. It like sounds he, like he, it, but he talks. Doesn't speak uh, real. You know what stream of consciousness is? Mm -hmm. Like when they, they go and start talking like random stuff that just makes. Okay, I'll give you an example. It's when you start talking about something uh, as if it's something else which you don't know that it sometimes leads to other things. Like one time I woke up, but then. You know what I mean, right? Mm -hmm. You remember that. You know, I just said nothing. But but that's his whole, whole act. He can do. It kind of sounds him. good. Kind of sound sounds reasonable. But if if you look at the long, the big picture, it makes no sense. Right. So what yeah. he does is like he starts speaking these r random languages, but he obviously doesn't know the languages. But he just gets the. Like you make, oh, you know, I mean, everyone can do like, I don't know, j j fake German Nazi language mm. or something. And he does like, oh, like a bunch of these languages, just like fake words that sound similar to something. And it's, uh, it's very funny. Yeah, we, we watched him uh, recently. So he's now, he's, he's like the band leader of the James Corden Late Late Show. Right, right. But, but he used to do just this, like comedy, but in that style, mm. which is pretty tough and, and he would play different stuff and songs and uh, yeah it's, it's pretty cool you got to check him out um but this is interesting because you know the the language thing man it's, it's we didn't plan this at all we didn't think about the language thing but i got so many things to talk about just on the on the language level like from my psychedelic experiences and my understanding of, of languages uh, from that to uh i don't know the books that i've read of, of like sci-fi ideas about language like recently i read this book mm. by stanislaw flem who, I mean, he's probably most famous for Solari, Solaris. Uh, the, there was a movie, George Clooney, right. and uh, another movie before that. Uh, he was a, a Polish sci-fi writer, but a very intelligent guy. He was very knowledgeable. And um, 
he was into all kinds of you know sciences and stuff and very you know informed uh all the time and he wrote this i've read a couple of his books and they're really ahead of the time but this one that i read the last was um i think it's the english translation is his master's voice mm -hmm. and so this was a a, a a story which was a you know a, a, the story was that scientists pick up the signal from space from obviously from some civilization that's beamed out at earth and finally oh yes we have proof of alien life but let's crack the signal because we don't know what kind of information it contains and this is during the Cold War. So the Americans pick it up. So they go, we got to assemble a team and crack it up first, because if it contains some information that's going to put us ahead of the enemy, mm -hmm. I mean, the Russians can pick it up first and they can attack us and whatever. So there's this competition. Who's going to crack the code first? So who's going to read the message from the stars, right? And they get, and the, the most fascinating thing, and this is one of the most complicated books I've read because it's very, very scientific. And I don't even get most of the stuff, but the, the idea is they, they make, or they, send a team of different scientists and every scientist crack i mean starts to analyze the code from their perspective so they send a biologist and he starts comparing it to a dna and goes oh wow this looks like dna this looks like you know it contains some information uh they beam it at, at some fucking uh simulated uh pool of primordial soup or something like the oceans uh on earth before there was life and then some some uh, microorganisms appear there so they figure out wow this can actually create life maybe this is how life was created on earth then uh, they send it to mathematicians they crack it from a mathematical point of view then you know physicists look for other stuff and they figure out other and every one of them finds something in this code that's mm. useful like it was it was like depending on your perspective you read it differently so imagine there was one language that you read and and depending on like imagine there was a language that a japanese person reads and understands one thing and an english person reads and understands another thing so that's what happens in this book and all of these teams learn different th things and at the end it's like very disappointing because they don't learn anything at the end and the, the message is like it's too complicated and and they figure out that maybe one day uh or maybe there's some obstruction like maybe their culture is such that because they look for military advantage or to weaponize the message they can never crack it because the message contains some sort of protection against that that it's it's just supposed to be used for for good reasons or something but one thing that they figure out for sure is that it was sent like billions of years ago it was actually sent from the previous universe okay so in the past, there were different theories about, you know, the universe and all that. And apparently the, there was a theory in the 50s, I think, where, you know, the theory was that the, the universe was endlessly expanding and then at some point contracting and, and creating another, uh, you know, Big Bang at the mm -hmm. end and, and exploding again. And this cycle would repeat itself endlessly and it would be usually around 30 billion years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was a, like a really mainstream idea back in the 50s. So based on this idea, this book says that the signal was sent by a, the, at the end of a previous universe where a very advanced civilization, knowing that the end is coming, they send out the signal to the next universe to either protect them or create life or whatever. So yeah, it's a crazy book, but it's very interesting. And, and, and there was another one. I mean, there, he has a lot of stuff r related to language because he was really prolific with his language. It was very, I, I feel really sorry for whoever is translating his works from Polish. And I'm very privileged that I can read them in the original language because he, he was making a lot of words up. As he was writing, he was making all these neologisms and, and all these new words. And uh, the Polish language is very, uh, it's easy to make these new concoctions and, and these fucking weird words, but it's difficult to translate to other languages. And he used the, the linguistic side of things a lot in his novels in a, in a sci-fi way, which was super cool. The story, the, with the, the cracking of the code, it's, it's quite philosophical if you think about it, because they're saying that their, their disciplines individually cannot crack the code. Yep. Which means that there must be a universal discipline. Yes. Or, or that, you know, every, right. whatever input you have, like from whatever perspective you look at it, it affects the actual result, which right. is like the quantum uh, phenomena, which the moment you look at something, it changes it. Mm -hmm. So it's like you can maybe never find out what the real message is because it will always depend on the reader. All right. Okay. Which is, I don't know, it's, it, it, there's many ways to think about it, but it was really, really interesting book and um, a great one. And one of those that, that you can never find a movie about, uh, made on it because it's just, it would be impossible to mm -hmm. make into a, a movie or something. The depth of it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and, and the other thing I mentioned was like the psychedelic stuff. I remember the very first time 
uh, I did uh, mushrooms mm. and I did a huge fucking hit and uh, I did like uh, 55 grams of fresh mushrooms and which is like more than you know five grams of dried mushrooms and I, I fasted appropriately and everything I remember one of my realizations, one of the kind of philosophical, profound notions that I had was language. Because in my case, specifically, what, uh, English, English is not my first language. So my, um, my parents were, my mom was Polish, my dad was Bulgarian. So my mom, when she moved to Bulgaria, she didn't know the language. Mm. And uh, she spoke to me in Polish. And my dad spoke to me in Bulgarian. And that kind of remained, even though later on she learned Bulgarian, but she kept talking to me in Polish. So when I started tripping, I started asking, like... Asking myself questions like, okay, is this okay? Is what's happening, right? And I was alone in a dark room trying to be really profound and, and do it the, the, old, you know, the legit Terrence McKenna way. And I was starting to ask myself these questions. And, and then I go, wait a second, why am I speaking? Why am I asking? Because I, I became acutely aware of my own voice, kind of inner voice. It's like, why am I asking these questions in English? It's not even my first language. And then I reverted a little backwards and I said, I should actually ask them in Bulgarian because I live in Bulgaria. I, you know, at that time, I, this is the language I hear everywhere around me. But then I was like, well, actually, I could even ask myself in Polish because that was the first language I ever heard. This was the language that my mom was singing songs to me in my cradle and, you know, and, and putting me to sleep in Polish. So, mm. And then I kind of looked even further back and I was like, wait a second, why need language at all? When I was a, a baby, I could cry and my mom would feed me and she would understand me and I would smile and I would be happy. So, you, you know, the most important things in life I could communicate without any language. And then I had this fucking epiphany, which was like language is it's sometimes it's a complication of a, a, a communication. It's, it's a too complicated method to communicate. Like, you know, it's, it's imagine our life is like a tree and the core communication is like at the, at the core of the tree. And then the language is kind of branch out and sometimes they branch out too far. So the signal doesn't reach to the core. It kind of lose the information along the line. Mm -hmm. And that was my idea. It was like, well, at the end of the day, like the most important things, like you look into your girlfriend's eyes and you see love there. You don't even need to say anything, right? So that was one of the profound kind of first ideas when I had this trip was about language and kind of how it's sometimes very irrelevant. And, and sometimes it's, it's this fake uh, artificial construct that we created and it separates us. And another way to separate us, we had this conversation before. Mm -hmm. You have different languages. Okay, so you don't understand me. You know, the whole Babylon myth, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah of miscommunication because of these languages but at the core we're all human so we can communicate even with with no language mm. you see a baby doesn't matter if it's black or white or whatever you can understand this baby and, and its needs right and how are we and going to do this podcast how are we doing the podcast without language yeah right huh? let's do it without language let's just, let's just do <laughs> <Sure>. music <laughs> no but this uh, with with the many languages that's irrelevant it will become one maybe very soon so whatever. i'm sorry there's someone on the on the, on the other line let me pick it up real fast. And it's a commercial. We haven't had those in a while. And this is a commercial for language. Language, an abstract, useless concept that's just there to fuck with us. Fucking languages, man, so stupid. Kanji, what are you doing? Wasting your time. Go back to meditating and looking people in the eyes. Maintain that real relationship. And it will really pay off. And one day, you'll be dead so it doesn't matter. All right, so uh, back to this conversation, man. How do, we, how do we get ourselves out of this hole that we dug ourselves into? This language hole. Steph, to help us out. I like language. What, what do you mean? I don't think it's bad. <laughs> I'm trying to say, well, well, let's well, get I mean, the fuck it out doesn't, of this. It doesn't stop you from looking into your girlfriend's eyes and seeing love let, there. Let me show you how something. How does it stop you from this? I bought this recently. It's just this a is, bonus. Steph, you're not seeing this, but this is Plato. This is the complete works of Plato. It's a book. And it's a pretty goddamn fat book. And I decided, you know why? Because I decided that I'm from now on, I'm going to study philosophy, like legit study, like start from Plato and go all the way to contemporary philosophers and spend the next whatever, 20 years <laughs> reading all these books. Because I, you know, I thought about it. I had this idea. Listen, I'm probably going to die soon. I'm not going to read even 5% of all the cool books that are out there. So why not organize my remaining time with these books? So that I don't just read compulsively. Oh, I like this. Maybe this. Maybe no. I just read in a very organized way. And I and I and I made this list of books. And this is the first one. And hopefully, I'll get to the end of it. Oh, sorry. No, I wanted to. I wanted a clap, but it. 
fucking jinxed it. Yeah, all right. So, but we were actually going to talk about another book. Steph, do you remember? Oh, yeah. Of course I remember. Do you have it in your place? Because I, I left mine home. Still... Do you have it around? Uh, no, it's at work. God damn no, it. What are, you, work. what are you doing God reading books at work? But what's the point? Fucking what's the point in having it? Well, the what point is we wanted to talk about it. And this book is The 12 Rules of yeah. Life. The Jordan Pearson book. Because... Kieran is also a fan, and he, you got the book, right? Did What's you the book? I got the book. Yeah. 12 Rules of Life. What's the book name? No, it's 12 Rules for Life. For Life. God damn it. And you know how Jordan cares about every single letter. We really upset the guy. You have to be articulate. Right. Articulate. Did you start reading you it, Kieran? Or? Um, I read through the, like, the introduction. Nice. Then I went back onto what I already had started, which was... You got the, back to the Japanese stuff. No, it was the Dead Sea Scrolls I was reading about. The what? Dead the Sea Scrolls? Yeah, yeah. You were reading the Sea Scrolls? Well, there's a book published by the... Oh, I thought scholar you were reading that, actual Sea Scrolls. The scholar published the book that actually investigated what? them. I was reading them. Wait a second. Was this something related to the Bible? The Dead Sea Scrolls? or Yeah, the origin of... Uh, what was that? What, what are these scrolls? What is this? So the scrolls were found in, like, uh, I think it was the, the Dead Sea. Uh, in a cave by a shepherd, uh, like in the 1940s. And the uh, Catholic, whoever's the heads of the Catholic scholars or whatever, they assigned like eight people to the work scholar on this. The scholar pope. Yeah, the scholar pope. The scholar pope. That's the proper word for it. <laughs> Let me articulate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the scholar pope put these eight guys in charge of uh, translating the documents. And um, it took like 50 years for the for the seven of seven people to come out with the translations after being forced into it. Jesus. Uh, and imagine if they demand. weren't forced. But the, the one guy who was a Gnostic, uh, John Marco Allegro, the guy who wrote the book, he published his findings um, strictly as a scholar before religion. Wasn't this the fucking mushroom guy? The, G the this, Jesus is a mushroom guy. That was uh, Terence McKenna guy. No, no, no. Uh, there was another yeah, guy. Yeah, this is wrote... John Mark Allegro. Yeah, this right. Is this is the same guy, right? Yeah, yeah. He wrote the Sacred Mushroom. Fuck! Next. I gotta read this book, man. I want to read this book. Yeah, right? yeah. He wrote the Sacred Mushroom book. God. So is it related to the scrolls, or is it something else? Is it yes, from the scrolls that he learned yes, about this? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So what, what is what is the uh, most kind of mind blowing thing about the scrolls? What is it that uh, you know it's contradicting to the Bible or whatever? Or well, no? It, it, well, the idea is that the the whole well, the thing I found most shocking was the Holy Communion, where you take the the cracker yeah, when you're like yeah. six years old. The cracker, that's Whatever the proper way. That the Pope is like, listen, man. It was actually the cracker. It was actually should have been a, a mushroom. Yeah. And trust me, it would be a much better communion. That the that the, <laughs> it should have been ingested, and also the the Ten Commandments were written. If you imagine, if you imagine yourself on a, a spaceship with someone else. And eventually, even if they're your best friend, over time, you're going to get sick of this person. Mm. Now, if you think of the Ten Commandments in those terms, in a small community, that's why they were written. That's why they were wrote like that. You know, love thy neighbor. Because in, in a small community that's underground, these things are important. Right. And so we found that th these, these actually translate back to this group called the Essenes, mm -hmm. who were around 300 BC. And they were just basically a bunch of guys who took these mushrooms, spoke to this intelligent entity inside the mushroom or the experience that they were having. And they came up with this belief that this second coming again, Messiah would come back. And that was, this belief. was before Christ. 300 yeah. yeah before 300 Christ. BC. This so, and how does it tie to then the, to the Bible and everything or, or is it it's disconnected? This, this cult is, what Christianity was founded on. Oh, shit. Right, because there were a lot of psychedelic cults, actually, especially in right. Europe, right? And most of them around mushrooms, like the Viking cults and all these other stuff. And I think the closest thing you can relate to today is if you imagine um, the the Tibetan monks with the communists of, uh, I think it's China. It's a similar situation where these free thinkers are challenged by a, a government that don't want free thinkers. I think it's a similar sort of thing, so they're forced kind of underground. Yeah. It's the same thing if you think of the way the, the Romans were with the cults that were of a different religion to themselves. They were kind yeah. of forcing them underground and they were carving things in caves so they could live there. And and it makes sense why the scrolls are found inside a cave. No, for sure. I mean, I, I don't uh, at all you know? uh, question the authorities kind of prosecuting uh, Christians in the past. I mean, this was the most obvious thing you want to... 
I mean, the, yeah, uh, they, they wanted to, to silence that. But that's very interesting because a lot of uh, people theorize about the you know, origins of Christianity being influenced by psychedelics. And it makes total sense to me, someone who's done it, because, you know, it's, it's extremely profound experiences and, and a feeling of, like you said, of, of like a sentient entity or some sort of um, intelligence that, that communicates to you and gives you information from whatever place. But the other thing is, I don't know if you've seen, there's a lot of like uh, uh, these... Um, icons and, and old paintings uh, very very old christian paintings that have like jesus and a and a mushroom yeah. And, yeah because it's like i mean you know how a lot of things in christianity were borrowed or it's straight out fucking taken from uh, pagan stuff like the christmas tree or Definitely. all kinds of other stuff so it made sense that if people already did that and then you go and say well okay now we're gonna believe in this guy called jesus then go okay sure but at least i can draw a, a mushroom in his hand because yeah you know I mean, if he was pretty woke then he must have eating the same mushrooms that we're eating, right? Mm. So, um, yeah, that's cool, man. And and also that's, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. And, um, you know, reading these stuff and, and, and what, the, the Jordan book and you're going to, I don't want to spoil it to you, but, but since I spoiled the movie already and, and a couple other things, uh, why not? Um, well, what I wanted to say about this book, I don't know, Steph, do you, Steph what is your favorite part of the book or what do you want to focus on the book? Uh, Jordan's book because you're going to fall asleep I just want to bring you up to the conversation my favorite part uh, is the (laughs) don't worry Uh, uh, my favorite part is the content (laughs) 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 no really I mean it's kind of everything is there all the rest is that's why I kind of don't like I mean the first self-help book or whatever it's called exactly how to make friends and I don't know what, how to make friends and influence people or something. I mean, that's maybe the oldest one. It was also like the content was the best. <laughs> all the rest was like, I mean, it was like, uh, don't lie to people. And then he was giving all these examples of people who didn't lie and their life was better. Like, right. Okay. <laughs> well, I get it the first sentence. But anyway, no, when J- Peterson was better, but I felt like he was kind of drifting away too much from. Too, too philosophical, you mean? Still, like it was not practical enough? Or? Yeah. Well, I, this is exactly I mean, what well, I he liked. Was, he was like, starting at some point, and then he was drifting, like talking about all kinds of things, and he was yeah. kind of getting back to it. Yeah, I, I so understand sense, what you mean, but was, but this is also like me personally. This is what I liked, and also the other thing is like you 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 say it's it's about everything, which is true, and and also like if you put it in the self help category book, because you, it should be in that category. I mean, it helps you. I mean, what I mean is, uh, I didn't get much more from. After reading the contents, I mean, just the topics. You mean, yeah, uh, if you just okay. read the name of the uh, the yeah, chapter. I did not get much, much more from it. I mean, I did, but not as fat as it yeah, was. Yeah, but, but it is, I mean, it is actually the explanation that is important because, I mean, uh, a yeah, lot of these things are cliches. I mean, we know you shouldn't No, lie. I mean, it, can, know it could have should. been shorter. My point is it could have been shorter. It, it could be but as yeah. short as the contents table, right? It should. It could be, but, but the point is that... In no, this I mean, the... Because I'm reading now another book and I think it's much better structured. Like, uh-huh. anyway. okay. and, but yeah, it's good. It's good. I like it. I, mean, I think it's great. You should follow these things. He's talking about. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean of course you should. Why? Why wouldn't? You? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they make but much, but this is the thing because, because you know uh, all of all of this all of this stuff like you know religions and 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 like the Bible and stuff like this they have this codified uh, information in these rules and they tell you. I mean, because the Bible is also a book of rules, essentially. Mm. So, but the way that the Bible works is they they give you these uh, parables and these stories that people can relate to because it, it was supposed to be uh, accessible for anyone, right? So, if people who are illiterate, people who couldn't read or, or understand anything, they could just you tell them a story about a, a dog and, and a cat and a, I don't know a, a guy working in his field and his son who doesn't like it, whatever. The people get this right from all co- cultures all around the world. And, and the Peterson thing is, is also similar. So he gives those examples because this is how it relates to people. And this is uh, the explanation. It, it's like this. You show you, uh, you know, I can show you a formula. I can be like E equals MC squared, right? And maybe to us it's complicated, but to a physicist, you could be like, yeah, sure, I know that. But then if you don't prove, if you don't show the actual proof of this, like Y equal, e equals MC squared, then you're not really doing, I mean, it's it's not, it defeats the purpose. And I personally... Okay, but... If I tell you I clean your room, 
Do yeah. I need to give you more explanation? It's obvious. Yeah, because it's, uh, it. I mean, this is, a, uh, and I disagree with you in this case because I love the actually explanation because those things, like you say, yeah. I've heard it many times, but I, I wanted to hear him explaining it. And yeah. to be honest, I went into this book kind of skeptical because I'm a big fan and all that, but I realized that once he got super famous, he would obviously read a book, uh, I mean, write a book because, you know, he was approached by so many companies, probably in publishing companies so it's for money, right? But the uh, point, but I think he was writing it before he got. No, I don't. I don't think was really. It? No, because he wrote one book like the the maps of meaning. No, I mean, but the, he wasn't the, that he wrote famous. for like twelve uh, years, and and it was a, a tremendous uh, work of whatever uh, his life and all that. And then he wrote this book in like a couple of months. But and now he's going to write another book. By the way, he he has another one, like another twelve oh. rules or something, for next oh, year. What? Yeah. Really? And, and he said he's going to start writing it next year. He actually has no, a, a specific know, time slot for writing because it. Because he, he had much, he had more rules, and he just dropped a lot of them. Yeah, I mean, you, you know the story of this book, right? I mean, he, he explains it once. He, he said that it, he, the, he, it, it was a Quora, Quora thing. Quora, yeah. Quora, yeah. They asked, so he was on Quora, you know. Mm -hmm. he, someone yeah. asked a question, yeah. so what are the rules of life? And he wrote an answer, and a lot of people voted it. And he was like, oh, I yeah, might as well he, write it. Yeah, there were more. There weren't 12. There were more. Yeah, so now he, now there's a follow-up book coming up. Anyway, but the point is... Yeah, I mean, but it's like, so it's like the B-side, the lesson project. Yeah, but, but, uh, but this is what I was looking for, and I was kind of like, I was thinking, this is probably going to be watered down, and it's going to be like, uh, so for the general public can understand it. And so I was surprised that it was, it could be understood by the general public, and a 12-year-old kid could read no. it and like it. I mean, so many people didn't understand. Well, I don't know. To me, it was, I mean, compared to other stuff that I read, it was easy to understand. But at the yeah. same time, it was profound. At the same time, it had stuff that you can understand with more experience and with less experience, which is, I think, what really good books are or good movies for that matter or anything. You know, there's layers to it. So you watch The Matrix when you're nine and you like it. You watch it when you're 20 and you understand more about mm. it and you like it again. Mm. So, and, and let, me, let me just explain what I like the more, and, and to tie it up with the religion talk. Because you know how he, he brings up, I mean, when you start reading, you're going to see, he brings up all these religion examples, especially Christianity, because he's, you know, you know he studied the Bible a lot. And um, he, exp and I, I was a very religious person. So my mom was very religious. When I was a kid, I was going to church every week. I was an altar boy for a disturbingly long time. I was like really into the whole thing. And like, to be honest, I had amazing experiences with the church, really. I mean, maybe I should, I, I should say a couple words about that because obviously, you know, the church is shit on and everything and, and rightly so. I mean, there's a lot of uh, bad things that are happening because it's an organization led by people. So people are spoiled. People are not ideal creatures, so mm. they make mistakes. But in my experience, I had really so many wonderful, uh, profound moments with the church when I was growing up because I was in Bulgaria. And Bulgaria is not a very religious country, and it's an Orthodox country. So the Catholic Church there is just comprised of priests who are on mission. So there's priests from Poland, from Italy mostly, who are really like, if you're, about, if you're a priest and you're coming all the way from Italy to live in some village in Bulgaria where there's like 10 people going to church, you really need to have a calling for that. Mm. You're most likely not going to be some fucking child molester because there are not even going to be that many children in the, in the church. It's going to be some old ladies. So the point is, these guys were really legit priests. They were really good guys. They came, they left their families, and they came to Bulgaria to do the good work. And they were doing everything for us, man. They were organizing trips, and they were, you know, pulling all kinds of strings with their home countries to, to make us go places and see things. It was, it was wonderful. Anyway, my point is, uh, of, of course, there's many things I, I disagree with the church and, and all that, but... Um, even though I've been to, I've been going to church for so many years and all that, I, I thought I knew a lot about religion and the Bible and everything. I was surprised by the analysis that Peterson makes of some of the most crucial moments in the Bible and some of those most cliche, you know, used up, chewed up stories in the Bible, where he really provides some fucking insightful information that I, I really loved. So, for example, just one example I'll show you. I think it was my maybe chapter seven or something, where he talks about the idea of sacrifice. So, he, you know, sacrifice is maybe one of the most popular concepts in the Bible. It's everywhere. Jesus sacrificed, right? Abraham, I mean, mm. Cain and Abel. There's sacrifice all over the Bible. The whole Bible is about a sacrifice. And sacrifice is not just part of the Christian Bible. It's part of any religion. Every religion, including the pagan religions, there was always a version of sacrifice mm. within those. But he explains why is it important and why is it such a crucial idea. So he, he gives this example. So first of all, let me back this up and maybe I'll, some of this will not be just what he says. Some of it is also what I'm thinking. Sure. 
okay, I, because I was thinking a lot when I was reading this, and also I had like some ideas on my own. So, first of all, like religion in general, you know, and, and the idea of God. You know how people used to like observe the world and see something that they don't understand, and they go, "Well, I don't know what causes this, but but there is some principle, some rule that makes this happen." Like there's, there's a thunderstorm, there's a thunder in the sky. You go, "What the fuck, man?" But there is some mechanism that makes this happen. So maybe there's a god in the sky who throws these thunders, right? Boom. There's a god in the sky for that. There's a god in the sky for this. There's god in the water. There's god in this. There's god in that. And this is how people started explaining these rules that guide, they define their lives. They, they, they extract them. They animate them. They create this entity, that, this god that, that, uh, that surely knows why this is happening, even if we don't know. Now, as, as human civilization kind of progressed and people learned more and more about stuff, one thing that happened was this unification where people started seeing connections. They started seeing, okay, there's a connection between this science and this and what happens in the water and what happens in the sky. And eventually, all of these gods just got together in one god. And, and people said, okay, well, some of that stuff, we know how it works. Some of it, we still don't know. So let's say that for everything that we don't know, there's still a god for it. And there's like an omnipotent God and, and he explains everything. And notice another thing. If you look back into the, the prehistoric, you know, the, the uh, pre-Christian religions, God seemed to be much more human-like. Mm. There were like, you know, before, I mean, like the Old Testament God is a different God. But, but if you go to the Greek gods or to the Egyptian gods, they have emotions. They hate people sometimes. They're jealous. They have feelings. They fall in love. They, they cheat on each other. It's crazy. And then all of a sudden, God doesn't have feelings. It's, it's almost as if, I mean, he seems to be more distracted from people. Like he sometimes punishes people and it seems not to care about anything and then loves them, but also like in a non-caring kind of way. It's, it's very interesting with the Christian God, uh, the Old Testament, because mm -hmm. in my opinion, it's, it's that point where people realize, well, you know, some of those principles that rule this universe that we live in, don't seem to have an emotion to them. Like it doesn't seem to happen for a reason. Uh, like, you know, I'm angry, so I do this, or I'm happy, so I do this. No, it just happens. Mm -hmm. Like a kid is born with cancer and we don't know why it happens. It's not because God hates us. It just happens. So this God now that unifies all gods doesn't have emotion because we don't seem to find emotion in quantum physics or whatever, in the theory of everything. Right. It doesn't seem to be emotion, but it's intelligent, but it's powerful and it defines our lives. So the idea of religion is to codify, to codify this idea of God and create these rules and these rituals that we obey and we do those rituals because we forget and we're weak and we're lazy. And unless we have a ritual that keeps, us, keeps reminding us of those rules that guide this world and that affect us all the time, unless we are reminded of this, then we'll forget and we're at our peril. I'll give you one example. I was thinking about this recently. So when I was a kid, I remember that there was this guy, because I was talking about the Gulag Archipelago before. Mm. There was this guy in my village, as this old gentleman. Uh, his name was Trifon. And I remember I was maybe five or six years old. This was the first guy I remember seeing dead. Like he passed away. He was this old grand, grandfather living like in a couple of houses away uh, from our hometown. And I went to his funeral and my mom was like, don't be afraid, you know, this is, he's like asleep, but you know, he passed away, whatever, he's in a better place. I wasn't afraid. I touched him. I remember he was cold. Mm. And this was the first funeral. It really had a big impact on me. And I remember this guy because he was the nicest guy. But this dude, he was in uh, one of the Bulgarian gulags in one of the Bulgarian concentration camps in the communism in Belene. So this guy was there for a couple of years and it was really rough. And he was telling this story once. And I remember this that they were feeding them so poorly and the food was so bad, like the bread and the, the soup, whatever shit they were giving them, that a lot of people got sick from the food and they would have diarrhea and they would die. So he, a lot of them figured out it's better if you actually don't eat. So at one point he didn't eat for 40 days and he was just on water. He almost died there. But once he got out, he honored that kind of memory of what happened. And every year for one month, he wouldn't eat. And he would just drink water for the rest of his life. So that ritual, that small ritual that he created is just a reminder for himself that, listen, there is this fucking universe out there that has an effect on you and, and puts some fucking thing on the table and you eat it whether you like it or not. So you better respect 
the fact that you're insignificant and there are forces outside of your control. And this is all about religion. And the sacrifice idea, to come back to this, is one of those ideas. So Peterson explains it. He says, well, imagine if maybe thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago, when people were still hunters and gatherers, closer to the animals than to human beings, they didn't have the concept of saving things. So if I kill an animal, I eat it, I'm fine. If I don't, I starve, I die. Mm. If I find fruits, I'm a, hundred, I'm a gatherer, then I'm fine. If I don't, then I'm dead. But maybe imagine at some point, for example, by accident, some hunter kills a mammoth. And he eats and he eats and eats and eats. And then there's some food left. So the next day he wakes up, he's like, wow, there's this food again. And then he comes up with the brilliant idea. What if I save it for later? In other words, what if I sacrifice my current pleasure for a future benefit? Mm. And this was such a huge idea that it was in the basis of our civilization. It's in the basis of everything. Economy is based on, you know, on, uh, you know, gathering resources. You know, everything, every progress that we have ever made is based on this. Our life is based on this. You work five days a week, so you rest two. You work for a couple of months, so you save up for vacation. Everything mm. is like you postpone some of your current pleasure for a future benefit. Otherwise, we're lost. So... Religion knew that, and I mean, you know, people knew that lesson was important, so they had to put it in the religion and make a, a ritual out of it. So in the Bible, for example, the first example is Cain and Abel. Mm -hmm. In the very second story of the Bible, Cain and Abel give a sacrifice to God. But here's the trick. God likes Abel's sacrifice, but he doesn't like Cain's sacrifice. So Cain gets jealous and kills his brother. And there's another lesson in there. So the lesson is sometimes life is unfair. Sometimes you work for years and years and years and make the sacrifices, but still doesn't pay off. So mm -hmm. you're not successful, you're not happy with your life or whatever. So what is the result? Should you je get jealous and kill someone? No, you should accept that. And then you should adjust according and you should have some sort of flexibility with that. And the answer to this, Jordan Peterson says, comes a little later in the story of Abraham and, and his son, was it Isaac, I think? Uh, anyway, so Abraham is supposed to kill his son, right? One of the most bizarre stories in the Bible. God makes him kill his own son. Mm. But at the end, he's like, oh, no, I'm just kidding. It's okay. You just go home. You just kill this fucking animal instead. And But the, the idea of this, according to Jordan, is that, you know, uh, you should be able to sacrifice even the most valuable thing to yourself if you if you're if the life is unfair and you to adjust to it and what is the most valuable thing is the value system itself is the dream that you have let's say you have a value system at the top of it is like the dream that you want to be a famous podcaster for example right mm. but i'm doing this for 10 years and no one notices me and no one knows i exist and i have the option i either keep doing this like kane and i keep working and even though i see that it doesn't pay off or i finally accept it and i say listen maybe i should do something else i try something else and i make it because I'm able to sacrifice this dream for another new dream that's mm. maybe more, it's maybe better for me, mm. you know? So that's the idea of sacrifice. And then this is also very interesting. This idea of sacrifice, like I mentioned, it's in all religions. It's not just in, in Christianity. It's in, it's in pagan religions. And then when I was reading Nietzsche, he gives this really cool uh, overview of sacrifice because his whole argument is like when people say and man he was so ahead of his time when he was talking about this was more than 100 what 150 years ago when he was writing about these stuff and they're still are applicable today when people say they're uh, atheists mm. they're not really atheists because from all that stuff that I told you about religion you see how religion is really uh, just an abstract idea of something that is deeply embedded in our nature. So when you say you're atheist, even the, the biggest atheists are are religious in their atheism. Like they don't believe in a religious way almost, you know? So Nietzsche was uh, had this idea that like if you look at the way that people sacrifice things in history of religions, you can also kind of see the evolution. In the first religions, in the pagan religions, they would sacrifice food, animals, even human beings, mm -hmm. external things like the hottest chick in the village or the, the, the nicest animal or the nicest fruits because uh, that is the most important thing that, that they had at the moment. They, you know, the food or whatever, that was the most important thing for them. Then when Christianity came along, people were living in a little better life. Like they, they, they were not starving so much to death. Like they were building castles and stuff. Like the, the world was a little different. So then they started sacrificing themselves. Like they would wear these black clothes or beat themselves up or not have sex and come up with the celibate idea and all that. 
they would sacrifice their own bodily pleasures. And then finally, when the atheists came along and they said, fuck, fuck God, it doesn't exist, I'm, a, I'm an atheist, it, you know, they actually, according to Nietzsche, sacrificed God himself. Mm. And again, by doing this, they kind of prove themselves wrong because they, they do it as a, as a religious ritual of sacrifice. They sacrifice God himself. So anyway, so that's the idea of sacrifice. And I, I love that, that, that chapter seven in, in the Jordan book. It was pretty cool. And the whole book is cool, yeah. Mm. Anyway. You mentioned that it, a lot of the books very obvious, in a sense. But do you think it actually has any practical use today? If you put those things into practice, like have you looking at the contents page? Have you put any of those rules into practice? I've, since I've the book? Uh, actually consciously tried more and more to live by the the honesty uh, rule, mm. which you know you should be, try to be honest and not tell lies. You know, at least always tell the truth. That that sort of it's much more difficult that you you can possibly imagine, <laughs> especially mm. because you live in a society where lying is acceptable and accepted and actually required in many things. I'll give you one example, like in the, in the corporate world, and we, we keep talking about this, like with Steph Chu and, and other people, like, you know, how many times you, like we recently had an event in our, you know, um, industry and there are a lot of these events and stuff where People are dressing up and they're being nice to each other and everything is cool. But at the bottom line, it, it's all business, right? It's all about money. People don't really mean it. Mm. And um, I think it, it's not because of um, practical reasons or caring for the money that people do this. It's actually out of fear that they're afraid to actually come out and be completely honest and be like, listen, let's just have a business transaction and let's not pretend so because... I think it would be better if people were completely honest and they'll be completely transparent. You know what the other person's needs are. There's much less frustration. There's less kind of um, guesswork and, uh, you know, a, a kind of a suspicion, aggressive suspicion that the other person wants to actually stab you in the back. If you knew what exactly what they wanted, it's actually better than... Uh, guessing that it's the worst thing because if you know it's that whole principle like in horror movies you know the scariest thing is not when you when the like the monster takes off his mask mm -hmm. is when he is with the mask yeah because then you think oh my god what is there right and your imagination is taking places but when you reveals it like the phantom of the opera it's like oh, well actually it's not that bad i mean so you know right, a right. facelift away from a handsome <laughs> dude so um that that thing, for example, I, I really don't like. But it's not not a thing that I can. I, I feel like not a thing that I can do by myself and change by myself. Because mm. everyone else, then it kind of looks and like, what the fuck did you do? Why why are you honest? What, what is going on, right? Because if everyone else is lying, they're expecting you to behave the, the same way. Mm -hmm. mm. So that's really yeah, but, fucked up. But that's a stable ecosystem, you know. If if everyone says the truth, then one guy will appear and he will lie. And he'll be above everyone. Right. Oh, that's an interesting so, point, right? Yeah. Didn't think about that. It's kind of a utopia. If you want. But then if you if you think about that, like what I said, what, what, what is then better? Is it better to have uh, everyone not lying? Like if, you, you know, if, you, if you're talking about utopias, which utopia is better? Everyone lying or everyone telling the truth? I mean, both are bad, kind of. Well, mm. not. Because I mean, if everyone is telling the lying, truth... Why is it if, every, if everyone is lying, it's the opposite. Then one will be telling the truth and he'll be better. I don't know. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand you, man. It's kind of a That's an interesting point, actually. It's balance. I didn't think about it's it. It's also the idea of what is truth. Truth is just a perception of that person. Yeah, what if you're wrong? What if you believe this is the truth, but you're wrong? Yeah, because your order of events that you saw <laughs> led you to what? believe the wrong ah, truth. What? Right. Yeah, I mean... Well, well, wait. That doesn't... It's, it's not a lie, then. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, yeah, he's right. Right. It's not a lie, so you're good. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> it's got deep, man. I think it's it's time for another commercial, guys. But we heard this one already. I, sometimes I, you know, commercial they repeat. It's time to talk about our vaginas. That's right. We guys have vaginas too. I keep mine in the fridge. What about you, man? I don't care. I don't like to talk about your vagina as much as I like to talk about mine. I keep it in the fridge. I keep it lubricated. And it's very nice. It has feelings too. It, you know, and uh, I put it on sometimes. People don't notice. It's my pants, but don't don't touch it, you know, because it's very sensitive. It's man vaginas. You can buy them. Go to manvaginas.com. And.
And um, let's get back to the serious topics. Um, what else can we talk about? Kieran, you're such an interesting guy. I learned things that I didn't expect I would learn. Mm -hmm. What are you doing these days if you're not working anymore with Boogie? Yeah, what are you doing these days? Uh, I'm still in the I same mean, do... uh, industry. Uh, How about another company? Oh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I've just oh. literally moved down the road, yeah. actually. But uh, yeah, it's it's opened up a whole new world for me looking at uh, companies in terms of uh how rules are set up to kind of benefit companies it's just strange you see rules that are set up and they they're set up to benefit governments but they may not necessarily be ethical hmm, hmm. like um let's say if you're deeming certain nations as a risk right so w w can you can you at least uh, tell us what 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 is like your line of work or risk uh, risk uh, risk uh, rating countries on basis of risk so you're assessing these countries mm. these markets for these companies to sure. enter and you're you're guessing how risky they are to, right exactly. okay exactly and then um, if you imagine certain countries are often deemed riskier but a lot of times it's just seems very political man and this comes back to my idea man i shared this with steftra and he didn't really buy it but maybe now this is another evidence that this is it remember steftra when i told you my uh, my uh, comparison between companies and and countries and how um, yeah. right so i had this idea some time ago that you know how like companies now are more more and more powerful like they're you know they're the money the revenues the companies make are, is, is bigger than gdp of, of certain countries like i mean companies like apple or coca-cola or stuff and they they have actual influence even political power over countries you know mm. and and there are some you know possible kind of uh, theories of, of a future life where you know, I mean, there's sci-fi books about like companies uh, instead of countries. Where, I mean, think about it. Like you have big companies like Google or something where not only you have like corporate culture, but they employ people, they, they feed people, they insure you, you, they give you insurance, they give you a, a thing to believe in, value systems, cultures, they expect you to behave a certain way, they, they look for certain people. It's like a nation. Mm. You get there and it's like, that's your country now. So you fight with other countries and that's it. My point being, Countries have been around for a longer time than companies have been, corporations have been. Uh, and, and they've had more time, countries, to evolve to a more civilized place where we, we figure out, like, for example, democracy is a, new, is, a, is a cool way to govern because everyone has a say. But companies are not so democratic. Companies haven't been around for a while. And, they, and this example that you're giving is another example because w what you're saying is like, I'm not trying to impersonate Kathy Newman, but what you're saying is that, uh, the, you know, those country, those companies are, you know, get away with things that individuals or countries couldn't get away with. Like this is almost racist where you, where you say, oh, this country is not good for us, but because it's a corporation, it's acceptable mm. to, to make like, oh, this is good. This will make more money. Let's do this. This will not make more money. Or, you know, and on an individual level is the same thing. Like they would... Um, I mean, there's a lot more unfairness, I think, in companies than there is in, I don't know, in governing countries. I mean, the, well, besides North Korea and these examples, but in, in general, I'm, I'm speaking. Because in companies, it's generally accepted that, uh, like, there's no equivalent of democracy in companies. Mm. If, let's say, there's a team of 10 people and one person is going to be promoted to the manager of these 10 people, it's not like the 10 people will sit down and vote and each one of them will decide. Mm -hmm, it, it comes from above, right? Someone mm. says, it's like, you know, maybe like, um, I don't know, an oligarchy or like an older more primitive way of governing if you were to compare it to countries mm -hmm. and i don't even know if this is necessarily for the better like if this is uh, for sure going to make more money who's going to say well we've tested it and we've compared it to a democratic model we make for sure we know for sure that the, the democracy wouldn't work mm -hmm. i don't know i don't think people have tested it actually but what do you mean it doesn't work I mean, you mean Apple doesn't work? No, no, no. I mean the opposite. Like, like money? if 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 Apple would, for example, come out now and say, okay, from now on, every let's say every manager will be uh, democratically elected from his team, for example. If they would actually start losing I mean, money there, like crazy, there are so many companies, and not one has done this. So maybe it won't work. Maybe they've tried. Maybe. Maybe, but maybe if all of them do it, I don't know. Man, I don't know really. I, what I'm what I'm saying is I'm just making this observation that there. That's I what I mean. That it, it's not the it's not very comparable. 
countries to companies a bit maybe but maybe in the future it's going to be more relatable because thing. they're going to be even bigger and stronger and like you know i mean think about it how much do you um the identify they, as, they, as, a, as a person of a what, what does the yeah but what does what's, what's the point of a country what do they want I mean, I can tell what a company wants. They want more money. But but, but what does, uh, here's the well, what a country is, or at least was, uh, it, was it was a construct that uh, collect connects people for their protection. It says, okay, these are our boundaries. Everyone who lives inside and is born inside has these yeah, but rights. What's, and what's the point? What's the purpose for protection it? against what's, other what's countries? The... Well, originally, you know. So there is no goal, but a company has a goal. Well, the goal would be no. to survive and then beat other countries and then grow, right? <laughs> I think the goal of a country well, not today. is to not today, right? Attract. But the companies, it's still that, so it's a more primitive, primitive uh, situation. They're both very similar. They're both trying to attract the the most. You know, yeah, but any hierarchy, you can say it's similar to any other hierarchy. Yeah, that's true as well. Mm -hmm. so, you know. Yeah. But the the voting that you mentioned, uh, that also could become a popularity contest rather than a skill set base. Yeah. Oh, for sure. It could be abused in many ways. Mm. But I'm saying that if 10 people decide, maybe it's going to be less abusable than if one person decides right, from the right. top, right? Makes sense. Because that one person has his own interest too. And he goes, I want to elect, I want to, well, elect or promote yeah, a know, person who's company, not going to be a no, challenge for me. But companies, no, but companies are not one person. They're usually like a board of... No, but come on, who this, like, usually it's a, it's a very small group of people that decides. It's like in a in a kingdom or something, you know, like with the, the royal family makes decision that affects thousands of people, right? There's a board of directors, there's a few people, old guys, and they decide. I mean, in some cases, in other cases, it could be a private company. Yeah, it's because, one person decides. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's weird. Anyway, different countries, different companies different commercials do you want to live in a country where there's no companies of course not don't be stupid it's better to live in a company where there's no countries what this makes no sense but it makes sense on mars you see when elon musk makes it to mars he's going to establish a new country it's going to be called tesla everyone who's going to live there is just going to make teslas and send them to space so you want to be a teslan Come over to Mars, man. It's pretty cool. They give you a contract, you sign it, and that's it. You don't have a passport, you have a contract. It's pretty cool. But still, this democracy is weird. Why do we need it? I mean, yeah, no, like, like not like like any one of us is voting. <laughs> what are we doing? No, but I mean, what? we're choosing people. I mean, yeah. we're all. Everyone, we're all we're all people. Why, why do we have to choose different things? Like all whole people. Listen. Maybe we need some. Maybe we should ask Google, like some AI should work this out, you know. <laughs> it's how hard is it? We need roads and hospitals and schools, that's it. Whatever. It sounds a little anyway. Japanese. We all need roads and schools. But we also need to choose people by rating them. Some are cooler than others. Yeah. So we should elect just porn stars. I think we should elect porn stars or something. Like people that we no, really we care really, about. We shouldn't really choose people. We choose their programs and their ideologies or whatever. Right. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, at I least mean, we should be doing this, but I don't think everyone does that. Yeah. Like who, who is going so, Googling out? I want to see. What, and also the other thing is like they all make promises and then no one is, sticks yeah, to the promises. Yeah. Once, you, once you're once so you in, you're like, oh, I'm sorry, man. I did my best, but you know, it's not up to me. And so, so I'll instead just of give the money I people, got everybody should cool, submit cool. a manifesto and we just read the manifestos and vote on the manifesto. Mm. There should be a law that will, that puts them in jail. You didn't keep your promise. You go Imagine jail. if there was a system, man, for rating everyone. And like the best person in the country gets to rule the country. Then it'll be just like an Instagram chick, an 18-year-old chick, <laughs> who's like, okay, listen, guys, Most I'm going to make a, every, every girl employed. Yeah, it's going to be pretty cool. Like, it would be a nice thing like if you, if you make an app that, that makes you rate people. Like hmm. everyone gets to rate everyone. And it'll be like trending people, and they'll be just like PewDiePie will be emperor of Earth. <laughs> it's dangerous, man. It'll be like crazy. <laughs> yeah. They should make a Tinder app for for candidates. Tinder, yeah. You just swipe, swipe for, for seven years <laughs> until you elect someone. Like, imagine how, how much swiping goes on. I think maybe that was it. Maybe they were like, they were using a, a Tinder, they came up with it in India to, to vote for a president. Like, this is too long. Let's just vote for, let's just like use it for sex. 
Because it's not going to work. My <laughs> finger hurts. Like, I don't know. Imagine it was like some really talented math kid was doing those. What are those called? Those thingies with the balls that you count on. Like, what, what is this uh, called? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Abacus. Counting abacus, machines. yeah. So they, they were from, from doing the, the abacus. was like, oh, you know what would be cool? If there were like hot chicks instead of those beans. <laughs> 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 like swipe, swipe, swipe. I want to fuck you, baby. I, I forgot how to count, but this is better. <laughs> and yeah, then man. they put the beats on a rope. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that escalated quickly. You're such a dirty mind. You have a such a dirty mind. Or did you mean it in like the Japanese uh, uh, meditation beans that you like the the thing is like the Zen uh, rosaries that you have uh, on your I arm? I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. No. Uh, what's that? Well, listen, man, there's so many interesting things we got to talk about, but uh, actually so many interesting things that there's a list of them <laughs> because we were supposed to do it. Uh, oh, right. We were talking about Tinder. I got my phone here. You know, I had this idea before that I can read some actual real people, but of course, keeping their privacy, I'm not going to show them. I'm just going to show them to, to Kieran here. Sure, sure. Uh, and see my tinder is booming i got at least one notification <laughs> and uh and I, I can read some real bios look at this this is it's pretty cool it's, fuck i ran out of swipes anyway but this is okay so uh so you, i can actually find some real bios to read to you just so you can see what the modern day girls are writing on tinder what kind of really uh, catch catchy stuff they write and step two if your phone is there you can also try to to find something interesting. This is, um, oh, actually, I had some really good ones, but uh, I don't know uh, because I never unmatch. You know, you never know. You got to keep them all. It's like Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> so I never match. So now I got to scroll for a really long time. Uh, okay. So here's an example. Is this some, some girl here? Mr. Darcy and Mr. Gray. Yeah, Mr. Darcy and Mr. Gray. That is the question. Oh, no. Wait, what am I? Blind? <laughs> Mr. Darcy or Mr. Gray? That is the question. So those are supposed to be two guys, right? Mr. Yeah, Gray, yeah. I know, right? From Fifty Shades of Gray. Yeah. But Mr. Darcy, I don't know. Uh, Pride and Prejudice, I think. Okay. So she's asking me to choose between two handsome guys mm. in this bios. This is how she's going to grab my attention and make me love her. Then she says, hashtag bookaholic, because those are books. Mm. It's the best books in the world. And hashtag wine lover and hashtag vegetarian. None of which I love besides books, but it's not going to help her get laid. What about you, Steph? Do you have something out there? Mm, all of them are empty. Wait. I mean, there are some, but they're stupid. I like the, I mean, you yeah, see, yes. there's just, just flags. Just flags of countries. There's um, some Ed Sheeran songs. Ed Sheeran songs. Oh, yeah, the songs are important. Love to, oh, this is, I love this one. This is an example of 90% of the bios. Love to travel, summer is my life. Mine is included there. <laughs> you see, so one way to win me over is just to mention two of the most obvious things that everyone loves in the world. <laughs> I love travel and I love summer. Also love air and breathing it. Like, what the fuck, bitch? <laughs> Don't you have anything interesting about you? Like, do you not realize it's another 200,000 girls in Malta that I swipe through? And I'm just going to, oh, this is the one that loves the summer? Oh, my God, I love it too, man. It's fucking crazy. And this is like 90% of them. Okay, travel. This is another one. This yeah. is literally the next one. Travel 50%. Malta for now. Thailand soon. Belgium. What? Marketing, sport. She's just randomly listing words that she knows. Sports, <laughs> plant eater. Is this like SEO optimization or something so I can swipe her based on keywords? Or what is this? Like Thailand, Belgium? Why, why, do, why, why do girls like to travel so much? I mean, it's not guys. Well, everyone likes to travel, but this is, this is no, what I... It's not as okay, this is a longer one. This has got to be good. I haven't they, read they, this. It's like they have nothing else to do. Okay, check this out. I haven't read this. Funny. Very outgoing. Now, this is concerning because outgoing is okay, but very outgoing. Adventurous, animal and music lover. Caring, smart, hardworking. I, mean, I might as well marry her. Loyal, easy to talk to, great company. And there's all just dots between them. 1.7 meters. 
1.7 meters, <laughs> man. Likes and keeps going. What? Likes smart, interesting, and funny people. Dislikes Jeez. shallow conversations, narcissists, and wannabes. This is so it's complicated, man. Right. This is like reading a job ad. This is like <laughs> reading a. Okay. Oh, well, this is cool. Irish Kaling. What? Kaling? What is this? Kaling? Irish Kaling. Kaling? What is Kaling? No idea. Irish Kaling living in Malta. Adventurer, thrill seeker, part time mermaid. Right. This one is funny. Always smile. Makes good things happen. Fighter, not a hater. It's a bunch of fucking. Actually, she's 31 how does she know so many emoticons she's fucking found a conversation yeah, go ahead. that that was left really unappreciated so her name is russian russian i don't know so russian I she's russian you mean? stop no russian that's okay. her name russian russian so i say stop don't be russian be more rational yeah like i say be more rational yeah and she goes why <laughs> Man, I had this one time. I had to ask her what's up with the name. The, the, because I, I, I asked what's up with the name and she said it, it's not Bulgarian. And I say, is it Russian? Is it Russian? <laughs> and she says, yep. So well, I asked you and you said no. But I had this one conversation with a girl. I'm so yep. trying hard with this and no one cares. I know. I, it was really funny, man. No, wait a second. <laughs> Let me just... Because... Oh, sorry. You deserve this. You deserve this, man. Take it. Take it now. Uh, I had this one conversation with a girl, and her name was um, uh, Anna on on Tinder. And I'm like, "Hey, what's up?" And uh, and then she has a t uh, uh, an Instagram or something, mm. and I see it's actually Analia. And listen, for someone who's ever done a single joke in his life. <laughs> If I see this name, Analia, I, I have to say something about it, man. I go like, you know, I, I made some joke. I don't know what I said. Like, uh, I go, oh, that, that's not a shitty name. I don't, know, I don't know what I said. I don't know. I said something along those lines. And she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, what the fuck do you think I mean? I was, I'm talking about your name. And then she's like, she got offended. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. She was also like 30. I'm like, am I the first person in your life to ever make a joke about your name? And you get offended? What the fuck is wrong with you? And I sued her. Anyway, <laughs> but um, so this one is made in Brazil, living in Sliema, Malta, a Brazilian girl, maybe someone in this crazy and unknown world. Even so, what can I say? This is actually like a conversation with herself. She said, human, and there's in, in quotes, quotation marks, human after all, trying to discover myself as one and another humans by themselves. Share kindness and respect. This is the key for empathy. What the fuck is what does that mean? this? Is I think she's uh, running for a vote or something. Anyway, so any how this was a uh, this was a Tinder Tinder uh, bios guys a new segment we're working on. Maybe, maybe if you register as a girl, they just let you choose from five descriptions. Yeah, that's why it's yeah. Nice. No, but like really legitimately, like ninety percent of the time is just I love cooking, I love travel, I love food, I love wine. Like really, man. I mean, you might oh, as well not write anything. Look at this wine. <laughs> but maybe you, know you get fat from wine. <laughs> you send me this uh, screenshot of this girl with. You remember what you sent to me? This girl that like looks for someone that she met. Oh yeah. Yeah, this was okay. one of the funniest things I saw. You re do you have it still? I mean, uh, no. I mean, I sent it. I can. Find so it. he sent it to me. This right. girl is like a, a photo of the back of her head, and then <laughs> so the bio yeah, I mean, is. It says like I'm. I'm searching, okay, it's not very literate. I'm searching guy, comma, <laughs> who was in Metropolitan when I saw him on Sunday at 8 p.m. Serdica Metro Station, dot. <laughs> where, where you are? Metropolitan Metro, you know, subway. <laughs> yeah. I'm searching for a guy who was in the metro station <laughs> this at this time. I mean, it was so funny. Where you are. <laughs> and the thing is, it wasn't like, I'm sure she didn't intend it to be funny. Mm. But it's unintentionally fucking hilarious. Like, this is, I want to use this for my life. I want to I wanna have a... On, it, on my ID. It's like a lost <laughs> card. You can put it on your tombstone. Yeah. I'm searching for a guy. We have this friend, God bless his okay. soul, uh, here, who, uh, he, you know oh, yeah. how you have these Facebook bios? Mm. Like a description, one, a, one sentence anymore. description. Yeah, he, he passed away. Yep. And, uh, no, he didn't. But, you know, in case people really think he passed away, he just left us spiritually. Because he got this girlfriend and he changed his bio and he wrote like her name and a heart. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, man. That was so pathetic. 
I literally, <laughs> I was like, I, do, should I? Unfri-? Like people had to w- just hold me not to block him. Like I was ready to unfriend him, and that, like people had to physically restrain me. I was. You sound a, like you sound like you have friends. But you yeah. Know. No man, this guy was a real friend. Like we were, we took a shit together at one point. This yeah. is how close we were. Like we were at a river. That's pretty cool. And we we're squatting next to each other and taking a sh- taking a shit. <laughs> this was how. I mean, we've pissed with Steph Drew, but nothing like that. Like mm-hmm. taking a shit together is a whole nother level. And we took it at the same time. Like it wasn't like you know because it gets awkward when I'm still shitting, but you're done and you're kind of like still squatting there and smelling it. <laughs> you know that's awkward. But when you're done at the same time, then you're like real brothers, man. Yeah. And we washed our asses, and it was really, and it was that yeah, year. It was not, this year, you know. It wasn't like when we were six, man. It was this year. <laughs> yeah, it was. A, it was year. May. But it was uh, such a nice year. We did so many things. Oh man, it was so, we weren't even drunk. We just did it for the fucking for the for this podcast. We did it actually for the likes. For the likes. <laughs> no, there were actually people who saw it. You know, I'll, I'll try to put this into perspective. So. I'm uh, close to my hometown and there's this river mm. and we go down this river and it's like in a canyon so you got to go down through these fucking bushes and rocks and stuff and we and we we leave our clothes uh, up there cuz like uh, like if you once you get wet it's you fucked so we leave the clothes there and then we go naked through the bushes we go down to the thing <laughs> and we get down and we put a camera out there and we take photos because we thought it was so cool like to take photos of like in the river when a, with a camera stand and photos and uh, ourselves there but we're naked in the water, right? So not to get the clothes wet. Right. And then there are people watching us from above there. And they're watching one grown-ass man naked taking photos <laughs> of another man naked. It was the, the hilarious, the most funny shit ever. So we, we like to be gay just as a friendly thing, you know? Like yeah. you can be gay friends, you know? Anyway. Yeah, as long as you so, say no homo in the end, it's fine. Whatever. Yeah, right. As long as you hashtag no homo. Always use that, you know? Yeah, that's no fine. homo. <laughs> Disclaimer. Man, here, God bless his soul. He's he, he was he's lost. He's in denial. Uh, but w- wait, what do we, we have? Tell here? his story, so so the world l- learns. So yeah, tell tell his story, mm-hmm. Steph. Mm-hmm. Share with Kieran his story. No. Yeah, but it's important. We should. I mean, no one is listening now. Who, who cares? It's one hour in. <laughs> we have like one person left listening. But, but there's a couple of people who skip. You know how they skip always to the one hour mark, the two hour mark. Every one hour, we got to get a little bit more excited mm. and just they, do something fun. Skip to the next video. <laughs> skip to the next channel. Wait, you long are... story short. Yeah. Uh, we had a friend. He got a girlfriend. Mm-hmm. We don't have a friend. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah it. No, it's not, just, it's not just that. But no, Change. man. Keep it for when people listen. Keep that one sentence for then. Fucking schmuck. No, I mean, he was building us up like this is something so important and then he goes uh, we don't have anymore <laughs> what the fuck man no, oh I mean I I don't want, yeah anyway uh, what I mean is I, I didn't tell the full thing but I mean that's basically it what, what more can I say no say it's something more you have to know you have to know the guy to realize what the fuck happened yeah. how he was this genius that yeah, he was. Appeared. He was a great guy. He was he's a very like, smart guy. He's, he's after like after a lobotomy, like this <laughs> movie, Flight Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah, yeah. It's like he's Jack the f- Nicholson in the end. He's the sequel. He's in the sequel. Damn. Here he's the yeah the guy in the wheelchair in the in the second movie. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know what's time for now? Uh, it's the, time for the end. For hated the goddamn week, man. Say goodbye. God damn it. Hate of the week, man. You you wrote that you 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 wrote that you hate slow people. What do you mean? Oh yeah, I fucking hate slow people so much. I don't know. You know, there's these people. I always. That's why I hate traveling with people. Why? I mean, I like to travel somewhere, to visit a country. Yeah. Or something because I have to wait for them to get ready to go out or whatever. And they're always getting ready, <laughs> forever. Anyway. I don't, you know these people that they're like, uh, you do something with them and they're like really, really slow. And they're like, I'm in no hurry. So they take a whole day, for example, to get back from, I don't know, I mean, my last such uh, experience was going back from the sea, which is like three hour ride. Yeah. And it took the whole day. <laughs> the whole day we're going back from the, it was a Wait, you, you were going back with someone else and you were waiting for them to get yeah, ready? Yeah, from, from the sea. Yeah, it was first getting ready. 
Then, uh, you know, we stopped at the city to eat lunch, to walk around a bit. Fuck. <laughs> it was like a three hour lunch, <laughs> like three hour ride, three hour getting ready. Yeah. It was like the whole day just spent doing this. But I wasn't the driver, so mm. I didn't have nothing to say. Well, so that was yeah. boring. <laughs> but okay, but nice try. But uh, what, what, do you, what about you? Do you have anything you hate? Well, I mean, you don't have to, but recently. I hate it. I hate this. Uh, I hate wasting beggars. Time. Beggars. Beggars? Yeah. You hate beggars, really? Yeah. They, what What makes you hate hate them? It's just, I feel like the the part where they extend their head. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think there's a way out for everyone, and they, I just feel like it's laziness. Yeah. I think there's. Well, I, you know, it's a, it's a complicated thing, but I I agree with you in the sense that um, I don't. Well, it's it's difficult. I mean, I hope I'll never be. Let's put it this way: I hope I'll never be in this situation. Uh, mm -hmm. And I understand some people who are in this situation, but also I, I, I know people who can, can do other things and they don't, and they choose to do this instead. And it's, I it's can a, totally see us getting there. Yeah, but you the know, thing about most, me is most people, most people, they're uh, they're kind of left by their families because they have some mental issue or something. Yeah, so they have no one to care after. Yeah, I mean there are all kinds of up. like especially like if you see kids, it's different because they're forced by mm -hmm. someone else. If you see sick people, it's also like you know they they might have a mental issue or something that they you know they sit around and uh, so yeah, it's it's like from our perspective, a healthy person is different because you figure out wait a second, if I was even if I was broke, you know I was a f complete loser, I would still r rather bring myself out of this. Uh, then, then do this because this is in a way accepting that faith, right? right, right. But, but maybe they're not in this situation. Maybe they're, you know, whatever. They're maybe um, having some issue I mean, that. How do you even get them. in this situation? Uh, mm, that's the problem. Like, how do you lose everything? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, man. I, I know if, at least maybe. from my perspective in the moment, I would, I would probably r just fucking die, uh, starving before I, I would beg. Like, but because of like pride issues, mm. because I have this thing where I go, no, fuck, fuck, no, I'm not going to ask for help. But other people would. And maybe if I was in a different situation, maybe if I had family or someone else, maybe I would think differently. And then I would have to do it. Or I don't know. It's, I don't know. It's a complicated thing. I haven't researched it so much to know statistically how many of these people. I know in Bulgaria, but, it's a I mean, it's sometimes, a fucked up thing. you know, we had like a woman come to our office. Uh, I mean, it happens a lot, but I mean, her kid was really sick suddenly and she couldn't uh, pay for the medicine mm. so we gave her some money but yeah. i mean shit happens like i mean if it's some sickness to yeah family. and also like i don't know if, if it's the same uh, elsewhere uh but like for example in bulgaria there's a lot of what you're saying the, the bad side of this which is like for example there are a lot of gypsies who who beg and they they beg by default mm -hmm. like you know what i mean uh they're you know it's a it's a it's a problem because um uh, you know, it's part of their culture. It's difficult for them to get integrated. They don't want to almost be integrated. Like we are ourselves, they're a nomadic culture. This is how we do things. We, this is how we roll. We're, we don't want to go to school. We don't want to do this. So they're not educated. They have a bunch of kids usually. Uh, they are in these big families. They, they live off of, you know, those social helps and all kinds of uh, additional money they get from the government and at the end you know like everyone else is begging so at some point they get sick or old or whatever and they go out of the street and beg mm. and um at this point like if this person has li lived this life uh up to now they really don't have another choice like they don't know what else to do but yeah if if they went maybe to school or if, if they were in a different situation they would know better and they would be in, the, in a different you know position mm. it's fucked up because like in bulgaria in general it's it's a big issue because these people are you know the majority of people in jails for example because okay. they because of that situation they they have a lot of petty crimes and, and steal stuff and stuff like that uh this is also like 90 percent of the uh prostitutes or or you know like a lot of uh, issues stem from like th how poor they are and, and how poorly they can integrate into the society and not because we don't try to help but because maybe i don't know this is how they were taught. This is how they were brought up, and this is what it, what they it's they're the okay with. In environment, yeah. Yeah, but it, it's an, it's an issue that has to be fixed for a long time. I mean, you have to sacrifice a generation. And it's you know how what is weird is sometimes uh, some of some of them make it, mm -hmm. but but they make it in that kind of sick environment. And what you see is you have, for example, in some cities, people who literally become professional like. Uh, 
at, at, at stealing stuff or yeah, uh, yeah. pickpocketing. And you see like at, at the seaside, you have these huge houses built by these guys who they have a lot of kids and they train them to pickpocket. And they literally, they have a van and they pack the minivan in the morning. They send them to the big city, they leave them and they come back at the end of the day to pick them up and they have iPhones and wallets and they go to big places where there are a lot of tourists, for example, the bus yeah, stops exactly. and all kinds of stuff like this. And these kids just spread out the whole day. They pickpocket people. And then they come back and they sell this shit and they live in these big houses and stuff. And they sometimes even send them abroad. The other thing they do is they a lot of times they um, they even sell babies to countries where it's difficult to adopt kids. They would go to uh, Greece, for example, and they would go to hospitals in Greece when they're in the ninth month and give the give birth there and just leave the baby and just go and and then they would arrange it so that the parents would come up and they oh it's a baby or whatever and they would sell it for a, i don't know 2000 euro or something they'll sell a baby can you fucking what? imagine yeah they sell babies in it's greece no. yeah what how is this legal what? it's not legal yeah. but because it's more difficult so, imagine if you're a parent and you're really desperate yeah. you want to have a kid it's actually okay but yeah. you can't i mean how, what do they say they Gave birth to it or what? Yeah, yeah. They they give birth in front like they 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 no, know. No, them. I mean, what does the new parent? How does he? Uh, that I don't know that that part I don't know. But uh, yeah, I haven't well I haven't researched it. But uh, I'll get to it because I, I was I, I was thinking of selling, not buying. So mm. I don't know how that works. <laughs> but um, when I get yeah, to buying, yeah, that's your work. That's your no, that's my alternative, my career alternative. I want to make some kits and yeah. sell them. If I could get pregnant, man, I wouldn't be even doing this shit. I'll be fucking having my fifth kid now. You'll be happy with working nine months for 2,000 euros? No, I would sell it for 2,000 euros at once. And just, oh yeah, right. It just said the same. <laughs> but I don't know what I was thinking. But um, it's the Skype connection. What else do we have here? We talk about hate of the week. We talk about, uh, you, you wrote something here. You said... Earth Shield. What the fuck is Earth Shield? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, let's talk about these things. Next time. Okay, okay. Yeah. Because we already have enough time. Yeah, well, what about you, Kieran? Is there anything else you want to oh, no, share with did, us? No, but you didn't say your hit of the week, did you? Did I? Oh, no, I didn't. Did no. no, I was just dreaming, like uh, daydreaming about selling my kids. Just, you were just too busy hating my hate. Yeah. <laughs> No, my hate of the week. Kieran, do you have a hate of the week or not? Oh, you said beggars, beggars right? right yeah. Beggars. We had the slow people, which was kind of boring. And then my hate of the week. You know what I hate? Mm. I hate those fucking fake blurry photos. Like when someone takes a photo with a cell phone. Mm -hmm. And the cell phone's lens is not, well, doesn't have an, the you aperture. Know, you know what you mean? You, you want me to correct you? It's called software blur. Right, it's software blur. Blur is pretty cool. Okay, thank you for this useless comment. <laughs> Just this domination of intelligence that you uh, displayed. But anyway, so my point is this software blur. I'm, I'm sorry for offending all the software blur guys out there. But the software blur happens when people are uh, just fucking tasteless, fucking pieces of shit. And what they do is instead of buying like a proper lens to make a proper photo or admit to the world, listen, I just have an iPhone, just leave me the fuck alone. I don't have the money for the lens. I wanna take a photo next to a wall so it's no, there's no blur. No, they wanna take a photo uh, behind the, the Eiffel Tower, but then blur it so it looks like their dad's fucking dick. <laughs> Like, what the fuck is this? Like, who came up? Because, you know, when you have a proper lens, when it, when it, when you take a photo, it blurs out really nice. And even, like, the every hair on the dick is blurred in a proper way. Like, if you take a photo of your dick, because I've tried it many times, you know, like, you, your legs are blurred and everything. Your toes are blurred. You don't I, see those, I you know, ugly toes actually. sometimes you have. Like, the ugly, you know, sick, the one sick toe that you have usually. So, but when you take it with a cell phone, it's like the software just, like, cuts out through your dick sometimes. Part of your bowl is blurry the other one is not blurry <laughs> Look, what the fuck is doing that? yeah and these guys keep doing this and they think it's the coolest thing it's like i'm gonna blur half of my kid and then just like a family photo and two kids are blurred the other one is not <laughs> look what are you doing man <laughs> fucking idiot <laughs> this is what i hate well but th there are some really bad ones that just make a circle in, in the center and they'll blur all the rest <laughs> yeah so you gotta pack up the family in the circle of trust and if just yeah. everything put in a circle. Yeah. The circle of sharpness. 
So this is a really thing, a thing that people should stop. There's nothing wrong with not having a lens. You can be a beggar and beg for a better lens. It's okay. You can sell a kit and buy a lens. But don't make those fucking software blur stuff because it sucks, man. What else do you have? Well, yeah. What about you, Kieran? You, you, you came up here with some dreams, man. With some, and we destroyed them. And you're going home now. You're you're empty, and you're dreams. and you're yeah. You had some dreams, right? When you were walking in this in this room, you were all proud with your dreams. <laughs> and now I see how you kind of change for the worse. Now you're going back with nightmares. <laughs> Speaking of dreams, though, I was actually thinking when you said about the babies in the hospital. Mm. I was reading this uh, this uh, this guy's work that mentioned um, how if those rooms were darkened to a certain uh, dimness that the kids would actually get more sleep so they'd be healthier and the hospitals would actually be able to cycle the kids up faster and they would save energy exactly oh. it's, it's very interesting the the, pa- the impact of sleep hmm. and so you're saying too much light in the hospitals actually like destroys the sleep for the kids destroys the development mm. really yeah wow yeah wow I was watching uh, this this talk by this neuroscientist hmm. uh, investigating different parts of the... the I always knew we should go back to the caves. I was always saying, listen, go to a cave, give birth there, keep the baby in the dark until it crawls out. If it crawls out, it's a healthy baby. You know, like the giraffes, the, the giraffe gives birth and then kicks the baby on top of it. So no, not, not, you know, imagine the giraffe's pussy is like five meters in the air. Yeah. It's, giving, it's not even crouching. No, it doesn't give a fuck. It's like giving birth from a from a fucking like from the twin towers. It's it's stretched between the twin towers, and this baby is like parachuting between, and falling down to the fucking savanna. And there's tigers and lions underneath it. And then the 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 fucking this is a real thing. The giraffe kicks the baby. Yeah, but maybe it's to soften the blow. No, it's just to get it to be like you. If you survive this flow, this one, try the kick. It's like, <laughs> no, the idea is, I think it's, it's about like getting it used to coming off uh, on, it, on its feet all the time. So it's right. like, you know, like horses, they're supposed to start running immediately because the older herd animals, they're always surrounded by like predators in the wild at least. So, you know, the, the babies are the most vulnerable. So they need to start running really fast. Mm-hmm. So that is the idea. Like when it falls with its long legs, like, you know, fall to the side. And, then, and so the, the parent kicks it again. So it gets up. The baby gets up, right? And they keep, keeps kicking it, and, and, you know, that's how they do it. That's mm. why giraffes are one of the best football players. I don't know if you knew that, but... Uh, yeah, that's nice. And basketball players, because they're tall. They're good at, at balls. But, but this dark thing... Mm. Dark know, thing. How does this make sense? I mean, the dark baby. Something about the, the <laughs> makes sense. dark baby. I mean, what, what, were they, what were they doing back in the... It's so what were they doing back in the day? Did they? It's, it's something about the way the light, the light moderates. Uh, I mean the, arti- the, the art- artificial light. Yeah, exactly. I mean the artificial light. Yeah, uh, it's. Oh. I guess it's similar to the way blue light works when you're in your bed on your phone, oh. about to go to bed. It kind of uh-huh. delays the release of melatonin, which means you don't get as good sleep. Oh. Really? Oh shit! Wait, is melatonin? This why it wasn't it the, the, the thing that makes you... <laughs> is this is why I feel like yeah, shit for the last 10 years. Yeah, it gives you color to the skin, I think. Melatonin, Freaking I think, phones. is a sleep one. The yeah. sleep one? Yeah. What am I thinking about? Mel- melanoma? Oh. No. What is the other one? What is the one that makes your, uh, the color of your skin? Is it serotonin? Oh, serotonin. Maybe melanin. serotonin. Serotonin is the brain. Yeah, no, it's yeah, mel- melanin. 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 No. So melanoma. What, what, what did you say? Melanin is the, the thing that colors your skin. What would you say? It was... Melatonin. Melatonin. Okay, melatonin for sleep. You're right. Yeah. See, I question you to the point of you doubting the the essence of your life. I did it on purpose. I actually knew it was melatonin. Really? Yeah, no. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I just wanted to challenge you. No, of course. And just like kick you like the giraffe is kicked. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So you, you're always on your feet. That's the idea. That's good. You make a good football player. Listen, man, this has been really nice. Do we have something else to talk about? Steph, what do you think? You're ready to I sleep. I, I can sense it in your we don't. voice. I just want to play guitar, man. He wants to play guitar. <laughs> Listen, man. I, uh, this was really fun. And I think, you know, you should, you should come again. Because, uh, first of all, I'm lonely. And second of all, we can talk about so many things. 
and there's a lot of more Tinder profiles to read. What, what are you doing on What are you doing on New Year? What are you doing on New Year's? New Year's? Uh, not sure yet. Hmm. Okay, we can come with us. We'll yeah, this fool is coming thing. over. Yeah, to Malta. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No so we, yeah, we, we we plan to go to Dingley Cliffs and set it on fire, baby. Oh, yeah, we'll make some photo <laughs> sessions. <laughs> yeah, we of ourselves. For those of you who don't know, because I keep mentioning Dingley really Cliffs, best. it's this place where it's, it's like literally there's nothing, and it's a cliff, and then it's a sea, and it's uh, the end of the world, basically. I don't know. Am I describing it correctly? It's the yeah, end of I, the world. Yeah, the only thing I've heard is like a suicide point. It's a very popular suicide really? point in Malta. Yeah. No wonder I keep going there. <laughs> I was in a suicide forest. I was in Dingley Cliffs. But why? I mean, we probably survive. No, probably wouldn't survive. Well, it depends. Depends on the amount of melatonin you have, I guess, when you fall. <laughs> anyway, this has been really nice, man. Thanks for coming. Thanks this, for having me. This is really cool. And let's stick around. Guys, if you like this, please subscribe. And also, I'll put in the description a link to our Instagram channel because we take photos also. And we never use software blur. So you can subscribe there and just, uh, you know, check it out. And we're, we're going to come back with a new episode. And who knows who's going to be here next time. Maybe you, maybe no. Probably no. Probably will never be here again. <laughs> I, I doubt you, I'll ever see you again, to be honest. It's possible. Goodbye. It's possible. Forever. <laughs> <laughs>